Yeah, so welcome everyone to the market design seminar and I'm happy to announce today's speaker, Andy Diang, who is an assistant professor at Northwestern University in economics and computer science. So thanks a lot for being here and to remind everyone of the rules. Uh, Annie will make breaks throughout the talk and then you can just unmute yourself and ask your questions, but be aware that this talk is recorded. So if you uh, would not like uh, to be on the recording, you can just um, ask your questions via chat and then I can read them during the breaks. Yeah, thanks a lot and the floor is yours. Great. Um, I, I'm actually also happy to be interrupted during the talk, so uh, I will try to make those pauses, but feel free to also interrupt me if it makes sense on a given slide. All right, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is joint work with Xiaoxing Mu and Vasilis Sorgenkis, and the paper is about dynamic aggregation of information. So specifically, we look at the question of how an agent should acquire information over time, when that agent has limited resources with which to acquire information, and moreover has to decide how to spread those limited resources across multiple different kinds of information. So just to give you a few concrete examples, one particularly relevant to the current moment, I suppose a mayor wants to know the total COVID incidence rate in the city. Okay, how might you do that? You might do that by testing. So suppose there's multiple different testing centers in your neighborhood, sorry, in your city, associated with different neighborhoods. You have a limited total number of tests. How do you want to allocate those tests across the different testing centers and also moreover potentially across time? Okay. For a rather different example, consider a newsreader who wants to learn something like the unknown cost of a proposed policy. Okay, you can learn about this by reading news sources. Potentially these news sources are biased in different directions. How do you want to allocate your limited time across these different news sources across, uh, across days? Right, so what I'm going to show you first is a model of this dynamic information acquisition problem, uh, where it turns out that the optimal information acquisition strategy can actually be exactly characterized. And moreover, that solution has a rather simple and easy to describe structure. So I'm going to spend the first half of the talk just describing this model and this solution and explaining to you why the solution happens to have those features. So for us, uh, various aspects of the solution are just interesting in of themselves con conceptually. Uh, for example, the, the, uh, the fact that this, this exact solution exists and can be characterized. Uh, but in addition, uh, the tractability of the solution lends itself to applications. And that's something that we ourselves have explored in the paper with three different economic applications. Um, I'm not going to have time to tell you about all of them, but let's see how we do and I'll at least uh, tell you about them. All right, so are there any questions at this point about the high level of what we're trying to do? Okay, if not, let's just jump straight into the model. All right, so we're gonna start with K different unknown attributes, theta one through theta K. We're going to assume that these are jointly normal. In the COVID case, you can think about each of these attributes as being the COVID incidence rate in a specific neighborhood of the city. Now, critically, we're going to allow for these attributes to potentially be correlated. Okay, that's going to be important for a number of these applications. We consider the COVID case, we might think that neighborhoods that are geographically uh, located near to one another might have positively correlated COVID incidence rates. Okay? Or likewise, maybe neighborhoods that are comprised of similar demographics, again, might be correlated. Right, now, we're going to allow the decision maker to learn about each of these attributes by observing a diffusion process. And I'll tell you uh, more about exactly how those processes are going to evolve in a moment. All right, now what the decision maker wants to learn is a unidimensional payoff relevant state omega, which is defined as a linear combination of the different attributes. So in the COVID case, we can think about these weights alpha as representing the fraction of the city's population that belongs to each of these neighborhoods. We're going to assume throughout that the weights alpha k are known to the decision maker. So the only thing you're trying to learn about is this vector of unknown attributes. Right. Now, uh, the focus of the paper is attention allocation. And we're modeling that as follows. So time is continuous. And at every moment of time, the decision maker has a unit budget of resources or attention to allocate across learning about the different attributes. So formally, the decision maker is going to choose an attention vector. 
like this, summing to one, uh, where the choices are going to determine how the different diffusion processes corresponding to the different attributes evolve. Okay, so specifically, if we consider attributes theta i, then the increment of the corresponding diffusion process at time t is given by this expression here, where the drift is theta i, that's what you want to learn, times theta i t, that's the amount of attention you're allocating towards learning about theta i at time t. Okay, this part here is an independent standard Brownian motion. This is a normalization factor. And what's critical here is that applying more resources or more attention towards learning about any given attribute is going to increase the signal to noise ratio of the increment. Okay, so you're going to get more information about theta i from watching the diffusion process in, in that moment of time. So if, uh, if you find the discrete time models a bit more intuitive, there's a very natural discrete time analog to our model. So there we would have discrete periods. And at every moment of time, think of the decision maker as having a vector of precision to allocate. Okay, the, the total precision has to sum to one. And then what the decision maker gets to observe is a Gaussian random variable for each of these unknown attributes. All right, so for each attribute theta i, what you get to observe is theta i plus Gaussian noise, where the variance of this error term is one divided by beta i t. Okay, and if we actually further think about these precisions as summing not to one, but to some integer n, you can actually literally think about this as the decision maker having a budget of say tests, right? You have n total tests. You're gonna decide how to allocate those n tests across the different testing centers. And then at each testing center, you're getting an estimate of the incidence rate at that testing center uh, where your signal has precision uh, given by the total number of people that you've allocated to that testing center, right? So anytime you have a total number of subjects or physical tests, this is a very natural way of modeling uh, how the allocation of resources impacts the informativeness of the signal. And then our continuous time model is very closely related to this model in the sense that watching this diffusion process for one unit of time is going to be equivalent to observing uh, one independent realization of this signal. So in fact, all the results that we get for the continuous time model are also going to have an immediate corollary in the discrete time model. All right, so the decision maker allocates attention in that way. Okay, those allocations of attention are going to govern or uh, influence the paths of these processes. And then your history at any moment of time is simply going to be uh, these K different diffusion processes and how they've evolved thus far. And your information acquisition strategy, again, is going to be a map then from any possible history into a choice of how you want to allocate attention at the, the current moment. In addition to that, the decision maker is going to choose a stopping rule, which determines for every possible history, whether you want to continue sampling, like to continue learning about the attributes, or whether you want to simply stop and make a decision right now. Okay, at the endogenously chosen end time tau, the decision maker is then going to take an action, A, and receive a payoff, which depends on the action A, on the unknown unidimensional payoff relevant state omega, which remember is that linear combination of the attributes. Uh, and it also depends on the stopping time. And we're being very general here, we're essentially imposing no restrictions on, on the form of this payoff function, right? So there's no uh, specifics about what kind of decision problem this is. Are you choosing between two goods? Are you trying to predict omega? Uh, the only thing we require is that fixing the belief that the decision maker has about omega at the time of stopping, you prefer stopping earlier rather than later. So this is going to accommodate uh, most notions of, uh, of waiting costs right, or time discounting. So uh, that's the model. Let me just quickly pause here and see if there's any questions about, about it. Sorry, all clear? Great. So then just a couple of comments. Um, so first, this is not a multi-armed bandit problem, although it, it certainly bears a resemblance. So the key difference is that in MAB problems, uh, when you make this decision of what arm to pull, you're simultaneously determining how you learn, right, what information you receive, and you're also determining a flow payoff that you receive. So there's this classic exploration, exploitation trade-off. Okay. In our framework, 
uh, the choice of how to allocate attention is only affecting how you learn. It's not determining a flow payoff. This action that you take at the end, A, uh, is completely separate of those decisions. It's only influenced by those decisions insofar as those decisions influence your beliefs. Right, so we think of our, our, um, our model as really being a question of pure dynamic line. And in that respect, our paper is related to a recent literature on dynamic learning from a fixed set of signals. And so this is a, an incomplete list uh, of recent papers with that flavor. And relative to that literature, our model is distinguished in allowing for many different signals uh, that are moreover flexibly correlated. Right. There's also a recent literature on rational inattention and flexible information acquisition. So here the idea being it's not that you, know, you have just a, a prescribed set of possible signals you're choosing from, but you can actually flexibly design uh, the signal structure. So their costs are uh, most often modeled using something that's prior dependent, for example, entropy. So our model is distinguished from that uh, in that our informational cost structure is quite different. It's prior independent. Um, so prior dependent cost structures are often used to capture something like a mental processing cost. Um, in frameworks like, uh, in, in applications like the COVID setting, uh, we might think that the actual cost of acquiring information is something more physical, right? You just have a fixed total number of tests that you can allocate. It's not like if you understand the problem better than uh, you're now going to have, uh, it's now going to be cheaper for the mayor to access more tests, right? So our, our um, our cost structure is, is really uh, meant to capture these more physical kinds of costs. All right, so let me now then tell you about our main results, which um, characterize this optimal information acquisition strategy. And so I'll start by telling you the, ver the version of our results for two attributes. So we're going to obtain a slightly stronger result there, and it's just going to be a little bit cleaner to state. Uh, but then all of the, and the important features are going to generalize for an arbitrary finite number of attributes. So let's jump into the two attribute case. So here the problem, just to remind you then, it's, it takes a very simple form. So we have these two attributes which are unknown to the decision maker, theta one and theta two. Again, jointly normal. The payoff relevant state that the decision maker wants to learn is again, a linear combination of these attributes. Right. Remember again that these weights are known to the decision maker. And throughout, we're going to adopt a convention that these weights are strictly positive. So that's without loss of generality, because if one of these weights were negative, you could simply take that attribute, redefine it as its own negative, and then the weight would become positive. Right. So this is without loss, but let's just take that convention. All right. So the characterization that we obtain uh, requires a condition on the prior belief. So it's not always going to hold, but it's, it's going to hold in a, a large class of cases. Okay. So the, the condition is as follows. So let's first define this object covi to be the covariance between theta i, that attribute, and omega, the payoff relevant state. So just to remind you that covariance takes this following form. So what we need to be true is that the sum of these two covariances is weakly positive. All right, so what does that mean? So here's the expression for that sum. Well, if we stare at this, sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2 are both variances. So they have to be positive. And moreover, we've adopted the convention that these weights are positive. So the only way that this expression could be negative is if, in fact, this covariance were highly negative relative to the sizes of the variances. So we're essentially ruling out these cases where the two attributes are highly negatively correlated in your prior belief. Great. If that's not sufficiently interpretable, let me give you three more sufficient conditions. Uh, these are going to be stronger, but, uh, but uh, still even more interpretable. So one sufficient condition is that the weights are in fact the same. So that would correspond to learning um, any uh, scalar times the sum of the attributes. Okay, in that case, this assumption is automatically satisfied. Our result is going to hold. Another sufficient condition is that the attributes aren't negatively correlated. In fact, they're positively correlated. Okay, again, then our result is immediately going to hold. 
And a final sufficient condition is that the sizes of your prior uncertainty about the two attributes is the same. Okay, so it's not like you, you, know, you know more about theta one than about theta two going into this problem. All right, so then under any, three, any of these three sufficient conditions uh, or under this, um, this weaker condition, by the way, this condition here about the covariances, that's, that's if and only if for our, uh, our result to apply. All right, so then under any of those conditions you want, uh, we're going to be able to exactly characterize the optimal information acquisition strategy. And it looks like this. So let's suppose without loss that the first attribute, theta one, has a weakly higher covariance initially in the prior with the payoff relevant state. Okay. Now define T1 to take this following expression. Right. Then the optimal attention allocation strategy has two stages. In the first stage, the decision maker wants to allocate all attention towards learning exclusively about attribute one. Okay. Again, remembering that that attribute is distinguished by this assumption that it has the weakly higher uh, covariance initially with the payoff relevant state. All right. So then at all times after T1, again, T1 being given here, the decision maker is now going to switch to allocating attention in a constant fraction. So now you're learning about both attributes. Um, and this fraction is proportional to the payoff weights alpha one and alpha two. Again, remember those are the ones defining the payoff relevant state. Okay, those are these weights here. All right, um, so in a sense, actually what's most interesting about this result is actually what's not on the slide. Okay, so what is on the slide is, um, is the payoff weights. The covariance, okay, these are uh, the prior covariance matrix. These are both primitives that determine the optimal information acquisition strategy. Okay. But note that one thing you don't see uh, is the realizations of the diffusion processes. All right, so this strategy is in fact history independent. You actually know at time t is equal to zero exactly how you want to allocate your attention going forward. Uh, that's going to be a feature also of the general solution for an arbitrary number of attributes. And one thing that implies is that the stopping rule actually doesn't matter here, right? So it matters insofar as you, you, you may actually not reach phase two, okay? So it matters in that sense. Um, but as long as you're acquiring information, you want to acquire information in this way, right? So you might've actually been surprised early on when I said, I'm going to show you the optimal information acquisition strategy um, because you, know, you might have thought ex ante that one would have to characterize jointly the information acquisition strategy and the stopping rule, okay? in which case it wouldn't really make sense to just be talking about one part of this equation. Uh, but what this result implies is that actually you can separate those two problems. You don't need to know anything about the stopping rule to know uh, what the information acquisition strategy looks like. Okay. Another thing you don't see on this slide um, is the payoff function. So one thing this result implies is that across any decision problem, where again, the payoff function necessarily depends solely on the action that you take, the unidimensional payoff relevant state omega, okay, and the, the stopping time. So that is a restriction depending only on omega. Okay, but given that restriction, for any payoff function, uh, this is going to be the optimal solution. So in a sense, it's robust across these different possible decision problems. Again, that's going to be a feature of the general solution. All right, so let me just uh, illustrate the solution for you on a couple of simple examples. Um, so the simplest possible example is one with independent attributes. So suppose that this is your prior covariance matrix given here, independence being given by zeros on this off diagonal. And suppose that you wanna learn the sum of the two attributes. Then applying our solution, what you see is that you should begin by learning just about theta one. Right? That's in a sense not too surprising, right? Because you have this higher initial uncertainty about theta one. So you begin by learning about the attribute, which you know less about. Um, you do that for a while. Once you hit five, six, your prior covariance matrix has become this identity matrix where note your uncertainty about the two attributes has now become the same. And from that point on, you're now going to split your attention equally between learning about the two attributes, okay? Equally because these payoff weights are the same. 
right? So that's the simplest possible case. Let's make it a little bit more complicated. So everything else is the same. The only thing that's changed is this, uh, we've introduced now a little bit of positive correlation. Okay, you're still trying to learn the sum. So then optimally applying the solution, you again begin by learning just about theta one. There's again a switch point at which your uncertainty about the two attributes has become the same. Again, after that, you split your attention equally across learning about the two attributes. So what's different now is that the switch point has gone later relative to the first example. And your uncertainty about the attributes, that's lower now at the switch point. So what's going on there is that the correlation that we've added introduces a little bit of a, a learning spillover effect, right? In phase one, you're acquiring information only about the attribute theta one, but because the two attributes are correlated, that's actually also providing information about theta two. So your uncertainty about theta one is going down, but your uncertainty about theta two is, is also going down. Um, so now it's going to take longer for your uncertainty about theta one to catch up with your uncertainty about theta two. Okay, hence this, this later time and these lower uh, variances. All right, so let me, this is a good time to take a quick pause and see, are there any questions about, I'll just put the result up again. Any questions about this result? Uh, um, th there was a question in the chat about the utility function. You answered it already partly. Um, the question was whether um, um, if you make no assumptions on you, is it actually clear that an optimal action exists or is unique? Um, you already said that it does not depend on you, but um, I think you didn't say anything about uniqueness. Uh, or is also is the question about the optimal information acquisition strategy or is it about the action that you take at the end? Um, oh, it's about um, uh, the optimal action, yes. At the end, okay. So yeah, so that, that's a good question actually because uh, I, I should clarify that we actually don't say anything about that, what that optimal action is. Um, so in our paper, we actually don't say anything about the stopping rule or about the optimal action that you take. And moreover, those are both um, objects that we would expect uh, in general to depend on all those things that I just said didn't matter. So the, the realizations of the diffusion processes uh, obviously, the form of the payoff function, uh, these are all things that are going to matter for those parts of the solution. Um, what's potentially surprising is that they don't matter for the information acquisition. The information acquisition, uh, is it unique, the optimal one? Okay, and good. And this is unique um, as long as you were acquiring information. So there is a, you know, a small technical point that, you know, if you, for example, if you know that you're not going to stop um, until after time 100, then it, the order in which you acquire information initially, that's not actually going to matter. Uh, but as long as there is a positive probability of stopping, then the solution is going to be penned down and be unique. Great, other question. Okay, fantastic. Um, so then let me show you the results for the general attribute case. Um, and here, so, all of the qualitative properties that I showed you a moment ago are going to carry over. And again, we're going to need a condition on the prior belief. So here our result is a little bit weaker in the sense that uh, it's not going to be an if and only if condition. Instead, I'm going to offer you three different sufficient conditions. Okay, note, by the way, you don't need all three of these to be satisfied. In fact, some of these are mutually exclusive, uh, but, but the result is going to hold if any of these um, are true. So the first sufficient condition is uh, the one given here. It says that the prior precision matrix, okay, or the inverse of the prior covariance matrix, has negative off-diagonal entries. Right. What that means is that the partial correlation between any pair of attributes controlling for all of the other attributes, that's what makes this partial correlation, um, that partial correlation is positive. Okay, don't get too confused about the sign change here. That's, that's just how that works. Um, so note that we've named this uh, perpetual substitutes and we've done that for a good reason. Uh, this condition turns out to characterize the property that any pair of sources um, are substitutes in the prior and also um, subsequently. Um, substitutes meaning that as you acquire information from one of the sources, that decreases the marginal value of information from the other. So I, I won't go into too much detail there, but, uh, but please feel free to take a look at the paper if that's uh, something that interests you. All 
All right. The second condition, um, called perpetual complements for this for the mural reason, says that the prior covariance matrix has negative off-diagonal entries, um, suggesting that uh, the attributes are negatively correlated with one another in your prior. However, the covariance between the payoff relevant states, omega, which remember is a positive linear combination of the attributes, um, that omega is positively correlated with each of the theta i's. So the second condition is going to limit the degree of negative correlation that can possibly exist between the various attributes. So roughly speaking, what that condition says is that the prior covariances must be mildly negative. And the final condition is a technical condition that says that the prior precision matrix is diagonally dominant. So just to remind you, this is the definition here. And it essentially uh, bounds the size of these diagonal entries relative to the size, uh, sizes of the off diagonals. And roughly speaking, this tells us that the covariance matrix can't be too far away from the identity matrix. All right, so then under any of these conditions here, we're going to get, again, a characterization of the exact information acquisition strategy. Uh, which is given here. So under any of the preceding assumptions, there exists a sequence of time steps and a sequence of nested sets such that an optimal information acquisition strategy is described by a deterministic path of attention allocations where at each stage of information acquisition, so between any of these two time steps, you're acquiring information solely from the corresponding set of sources. All right. So you begin by, say, uh, putting all your attention on one attribute. Okay, you do that for a while until you hit the first time step. Then you add in, say, another attribute. You now redistribute your attention across these two attributes. But you, you keep that constant mixture until you hit the next time step add in more, redistribute, so on and so forth. And just like in the k is equal to two example, at the final stage of information acquisition, your attention is again going to be proportional to this weight vector alpha defining, um, defining the payoff relevant state to the main. And here I'm not giving you closed form expressions for the different time steps and the different nested sets. Uh, but um, as in the k is equal to two case, the full path of attention allocations can be computed from the same two primitives. So it's just this weight vector alpha and the prior covariance matrix sigma that matter. Okay. And in particular, all of those properties that I pointed out earlier uh, continue to hold. So the solution is history independent. Right, you know what you want to do at time t is equal to zero. Um, it's independent of the stopping rule. So that's actually a property we're going to take advantage of in, in one of the applications. Right, so you don't have to solve for these jointly. You can actually take information acquisition as given by the solution here and then solve for the stopping rule in that simpler problem. Um, and finally, it's robust across decision problems. Any questions about the general K result? Yeah, we have one question in the chat about um, uh, what is the difference between uh, forward-looking versus uh, myopic-looking uh, agents and how um, this affects the solution. Great, yeah, uh, great question. Um, so one thing I didn't highlight here is that, uh, in fact, this is also going to be the myopic solution. So whenever our assumptions hold, uh, one implication of the result is that myopically acquiring information, and by myopically acquiring, actually, so I'll, I'll say more about this in a moment in the, in the proof sketch, but essentially you just acquire information in the way to maximally reduce uh, uncertainty immediately about the payoff relevant state, that's going to be the optimal forward-looking solution as well. Yeah, so that's actually a perfect segue then into this next section. So let me tell you a bit about why the result ends up looking the way that it does. Um, so I think it's actually easiest to begin by thinking about a static version of our problem. Uh, 
Uh, so let's consider this COVID case. Um, you're a mayor, you wanna learn the total COVID incidence rate in your city, that's Omega. Uh, there are three testing centers in your city. Each of them serves a given neighborhood. And let's just say that each of these theta i's corresponds to the incidence rates within that neighborhood. Okay, so theta one is the incidence rates in neighborhood one. Right, so then Omega is a weighted average of these different theta i's. So you're the mayor, you have a total of T tests that you get to allocate across these different testing centers. Again, it's a static problem, you're just gonna do this once and for all. Right, so because we're working with Gaussian unknowns, uh, your posterior variance about omega can be written as a function solely of the way that you allocate the tests. So Q1, Q2, Q3 being the total number of tests allocated to each of these testing centers. And in particular, the actual realizations of the signals doesn't matter for the, um, the outcome of this posterior variance. Okay. Moreover, uh, again, because we're working with a unidimensional payoff relevant Gaussian unknown, we can actually black hole order all of these different information acquisitions uh, based on the posterior variance, that's, that's the results. And so it doesn't matter what decision problem you're facing, the best thing to do for any decision problem is always to reduce the posterior variance about omega. So the solution for the static problem then is very straightforward. Uh, it's going to be to identify that Q1, Q2, and Q3 that minimize this, uh, this posterior variance function, subject of course to the total allocation summing to no more than T. All right, and let's just define for any T, let's define Q star of T to be the optimal allocation of, uh, the optimal static allocation of T total tests. Now, there's a close resemblance between the static problem and a dynamic problem with a known end date. Okay, so now we can take one step towards our dynamic problem. So suppose that you're acquiring information over time, just as in our main model, uh, and you know that at time uh, t is equal to 100, that's when you're going to stop and make your decision. So in that case, um, what you want to do then is optimally acquire information in any way. So this goes back to the previous question about uniqueness. Um, so you want to acquire information in any way that's going to get you to this Q star of T at the stop, um, at this exogenous end. Right? So the order doesn't matter, but the cumulative amount of attention has to match this Q star of, if you know, we're stopping at the time 100, then Q star of 100. So the known end date problem is then you know, as straightforward as the static problem. Okay. What gets complicated when the end date is uncertain? Okay. So what gets complicated is the possibility for something like this to happen. So suppose that if you knew you were stopping at time 100, okay, or equivalently you were uh, allocating 100 total tests, the optimal way of allocating that 100, uh, that budget of 100 tests is in fact to allocate all of those tests to testing center one. Okay, zero to two, zero to three. But suppose that uh, the optimal way of allocating 101 tests is to allocate one test to testing center one, 50 to two and 50 to three. So the, the, the first thing to note is that these two allocations are in a sense in conflict with one another, right? If you allocate tests uh, in this way to achieve this allocation at time 100, you're not possibly going to be able to achieve this allocation at time 101, because that's going to require you to actually take back some tests that you've already allocated to testing center one. You're not allowed to take back tests. You can't unlearn things that you've already learned. So this decision maker then facing an uncertain end date uh, would also then encounter an intertemporal trade-off, right? You have to decide, do I care more about minimizing my uncertainty about omega at time 100, making a better decision at this point in time, if I were to stop then, or do I care more about making a better decision at time 101, if I were to stop then? Right. And in general, the way that you trade off across these different periods is going to depend on the realizations of the signals thus far. It's going to depend on your payoff function, um, it, you know, all of these things that, uh, that didn't appear in our optimal solution. All right, so. Hopefully this highlights for you sort of the, the, the main tension that can arise in the dynamic version of the problem compared to the static problem. Okay. 
But now let's suppose that actually this tension doesn't in fact arise, all right? So let's just assume it away. Uh, suppose that in fact, these solutions, so let me just call these uh, T optimal vectors, right? So remember, this is the optimal static allocation of T units of, um, of attention. Okay. Just imagine arraying all of these solutions okay, across time for various choices of T. Suppose that these vectors were actually increasing in each of your coordinates across time, exactly ruling out a case like this, right, where the this first coordinate is decreasing as t increases. Right, so suppose q star of t is monotonically increasing, uh, meaning in a sense that you can actually string together all of these t optimal solutions using a single sampling strategy. If that were possible, okay, let's call such a strategy uniformly optimal. And along such a strategy, you would then be achieving each of these optimal static allocations, meaning you're actually minimizing posterior variance at every moment of time. Right. So intuitively, uh, this sounds like a pretty great strategy because now you don't have to make trade-offs like what we just discussed, right? It's not like you have to decide, do I care more about minimizing variance at 101 versus 100? You're able to achieve both, right? And intuitively, it might sound then like the decision problem doesn't matter. This should actually be best for any intertemporal decision problem. Uh, so that actually is not so straightforward. It requires proof, uh, but it ends up being true. So if a uniformly optimal strategy exists, allowing you to minimize posterior variance at every moment, then that strategy is best across decision problems. And uh, our different sufficient conditions on the prior belief all play the role of guaranteeing that, in fact, this Q star of T is actually increasing in T. All right, so let me just um, make a quick comment about this. All right, so then the question becomes, uh, you know, when is Q star of T in fact monotonely increasing? And that problem actually turns out to have an analogy with a classic problem from consumer demand. Uh, so going back to your uh, first intermediate micro course, uh, suppose you have a utility function over consumption of K different goods. So here, Q of K is your quantity of consumption of good K. Then fixing a price vector P and fixing a total wealth W, let D of PW denote your demand function subject to this budget constraint here. Then remember that demand is normal if each coordinate of this demand function increases with your income. Right, so as you get wealthier, you demand each, more of each of these goods. And then if we let the utility function be the negative of posterior variance, if we take the price vector to be the vector of all ones, and if we take your total wealth to be T, your total budget of attention, then normality of demand in our setting is exactly equivalent to monotonicity of these T optimal attention vectors. Right? As your total budget of attention grows, you demand more information from each of the sources. That's exactly what that monotonicity is saying. Um, and our condition perpetual complementarity is directly related to a sufficient condition for normality of demand from this literature. Uh, the other properties, uh, the other conditions rely on specific properties of our uh, specific utility function. So this negative posterior variance. And we haven't explored whether they um, uh, they relate to a broader class of utility functions. So that's sort of an interesting open problem. All right, and then going back to the previous question about myopic uh, allocation. So when a uniformly optimal strategy exists, then the optimal attention allocations are simply the time derivatives of these factors, i.e. greedy optimization. So our conditions also are uh, sufficient for greedy optimization to be optimal. And what's happening, the reason we have this nested structure um, is that at every stage, the agent is simply identifying those attributes that have the highest marginal value for learning about omega. Marginal value in the sense that you're, you're maximally reducing uncertainty about omega. And then you divide your attention among those attributes with the highest marginal value. Okay, what's sort of not obvious but true is that the mixtures that we obtain in the solution uh, maintain that equivalence. So the marginal values stay equal during that stage but reduce altogether. And then at, um, at some point, some 
attribute outside of your set has a marginal value as high as the marginal values of the, uh, the attributes in your set. At that point, you expand your observation set to include that new attribute, so on and so forth. And, and this is exactly what gives uh, the structure of the solution. All right, great. So let me pause here again and see if there's any questions about the proof sketch. Um, yeah, we had a um, question in the chat about the example with the three test centers. Um, yeah. I don't know whether, Emre, would you like to unmute yourself? You can ask it yourself. Otherwise, I can read it. Sure, I'll, I'll ask. Uh, um, uh, there's a bit of background noise, so that's why I wasn't. Um, so uh, I was a little bit puzzled because how can the solution jump from 100, 0, 0 to 1, 50, 50? So I was wondering whether that meant that like the payoffs are very similar between the two. So how much would I lose if I went with 100 and 1, 0, 0, for example? Yeah, good. Okay, so there's two parts to your questions. First, you know, how could this even be the case? Um, so the, the reason this would happen is if there were some sort of strong complementarity across testing centers two and three, but a complementarity that required you to have sufficient um, observation of each of these sources. Right, so the idea is just a little bit of information from two and three. Um, there's some complementarity, but still you'd rather allocate your attention towards one. Uh, but if you can acquire a lot of information from data two and a lot of information from data three, then those uh, observations together create, uh, create very good information. I mean, somehow we kind of push the utility into the background. And so mm -hmm. with Gaussian signals, how could that happen, that kind of complementary? I mean, does the complementary come from the you or uh, the utility, or if that doesn't play a role, where is it coming from? Yeah, so that, another great question. So it, it's not coming from you, it's coming from the, the posterior variance function, right? So remember, we have this posterior variance function. It's written as a function of these counts, right? Um, and what's going on in these examples is that, is that there's potentially complementarities across, uh, also substitution effects across these different choices of Q. Right, so we're essentially, uh, so a lot of the analysis is looking at these cross partials. So as you increase Q1, how does that uh, increase the, uh, the marginal value of say increasing Q2? So, so that's true even for just like Gaussian with those weights because everything looks so continuous and smooth uh, in the way the problem was described, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. well, uh, right. So in this sort of stylex example, this is, I'm giving you a, an extra budget, of, sorry, an extra unit of attention, right? From 100 to 101. So if you looked at the instantaneous, um, what, what this would mean for, um, uh, yeah, the instantaneous moment is that the optimal mixture would actually have negatives in some of these coordinates. So if you ask the question of what is the optimal mixture for maximally reducing V in the current moment, you would actually get that instead of wanting to increase attention in, in positive amounts, you actually want to take attention away from one of these, these attributes. So that's uh, that's a bit more precisely what's going on. And, and here I'm sort of heuristically waving my hands at that by saying that you know if you have enough of these negative vectors that can actually accumulate to something that looks like like this. Thank you. Um, so th there was another good question you had the first time you spoke, I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, so you asked how this could be. Do you recall what's the second part of your question? Uh, I wondered whether the payoffs are similar. So what if I went oh, with right, 100 right. I want, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so good. So this entire paper is about the exact optimal solution. Um, so it's quite possible that uh, even when our conditions on the prior aren't satisfied, the solution that we give is still sort of approximately optimal. Uh, but th that's just not something we looked at. We, we strongly believe that to be true. Uh, I mean, I guess you have to be, what exactly is the sense of approximately optimal, but we strongly believe that there's a sense of approximately optimal for which that's that's possible to prove. Uh, we just haven't looked at that in the present paper. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so so why why do we find exact optimality to be something that's, uh, that's interesting? So one benefit of having a solution that's exactly optimal uh, is you can do things like uh, look at comparative statics or input that solution into other problems. So, um, right, you know, we found, you know, for us, it was just interesting to see that the solution had the property set I have just told you about. Um, but in addition, you can take that characterization and you can use that to derive new results in uh, settings motivated by specific economic questions. Um, so in our paper, we look at three applications where we use this characterization to first tractably introduce correlation in settings that have been previously studied under strong assumptions of independence. 
Um, and we use our uh, characterization to also de derive results about economic behaviors that are you know, not necessarily directly related to information acquisition. So let me see how much time I have. Okay, so I, I'm going to have time, I think, to tell you about just one of these applications. So let me just quickly tell you about what the, you know, give you a sense of what the three are, and, and then I'll uh, tell you about one in more detail. Um, so the first application that we look at is to binary choice. So there is a large literature on these binary choice problems where a decision maker can choose between two goods, but the payoffs to those two goods are unknown to you. Right. And potentially you receive information about those two payoffs before you make your decision, uh, potentially at an endogenously chosen stopping time. So Fjordenberg et al. is this recent paper um, where they look at a binary choice problem where the decision maker is acquiring information, um, is, is choosing how to acquire information uh, prior to making a decision about when to stop and, uh, and um, which, which payoff to choose. And they uh, consider a model that's actually nested within ours. Um, and some of the results are we're able to, to generalize. Um, so specifically, they have their main result is uh, about the relationship between stopping times and choice accuracy. So they look at this question of, you know, if you observe when the decision maker stops, how does the time at which they stop relate to uh, the probability that they end up choosing the better of the two goods. Let me actually just briefly, I'm not gonna tell you about this application in any, any great detail, so let me just tell you about this part here. Um, so right, so you can define for any T, right? Suppose you stop at time T, what is the probability you choose the better good? And this isn't obvious, um, you know, what that relationship would be because on the one hand, mechanically at later times, you have more information. So that suggests that you should uh, make better decisions when you stop later. On the other hand, if the stopping time is endogenously chosen, then you're likely to choose the stop exactly when the decision is easy, right? When you re receive information telling you that one good is much better than the other. So in that case, we might expect that if we see the decision maker stopping early, then actually the decision maker is likely to make the, the correct decision in that case. And their main result is that uh, this function P of T is weakly decreasing over time so that in fact, earlier decisions are associated with more accurate decisions. Uh, but they show this starting from an assumption that the decision maker's prior covariance matrix about the two payoffs has this specific form, right? This imposes independence, so it can't be correlation across the payoffs, and it also imposes uh, symmetry in your initial uncertainty about the two payoffs. And what we're able to do is apply our characterization to generalize this, to show that in fact, starting from any covariance matrix, allowing for correlation, allowing for asymmetry, uh, you can still show that earlier stopping times are associated with more accurate decisions. So you know, let me just say only those very brief comments here, but um, that's our first application. Um, I'll tell you about application two in more detail, so let me skip that for the moment. Uh, application three is, is not, it's, it's not a generalization. So an application when we, we straight up obtain a generalization of a recent results. Uh, so here it's not a generalization, but we obtain a sort of complementary result uh, to this recent paper that some of you might know uh, by Gossner et al. Um, so this, uh, this paper is about attention manipulation, right? So suppose the decision maker doesn't really get to choose, control their attention at every moment of time, the way that they have, the decision maker can in our model, but instead somebody comes in and forces the decision maker to uh, pay attention to one of the sources, right? You can ask, how does that one-time attention manipulation affect the subsequent path of, uh, of attention allocation? And that's something we can, we can directly use our results to study. All right, so then the application that I wanna tell you about in more detail uh, in the remaining time is this one about biased news sources. So different from the, the other two applications, uh, this one is sort of isn't building on or, or generalizing any recent results. It's looking at a, a new game that we wrote down ourselves. Right. So the game is as follows. There's two sources, two news sources. Um, you can think about this as a liberal and a conservative news source. And they're reporting on a common unknown omega. So you can think about this as something like the cost of a proposed policy. Right. Now we have in mind settings where the partisan implications of this policy are not directly known to the general public, okay, although they're understood by the sources. 
so this is not, you know, um, in the United States, this would not be something like gun control where everybody knows what the liberal stance is and what the conservative stance is. Okay, this is anything that sort of gets less news coverage than that. So then B, which we define to be the benefit to source one's party when the reader believes that omega is large, that from the perspective of the reader is going to be a random variable. So it's not precisely known. Now, the two news sources are going to both report on Omega, but they're going to bias the reporting in opposite direction. They're going to choose two things, right? uh, an intensity of bias theta i and a noisiness of their signals zeta i. So specifically, source one is going to give signals that look like this. So a unit of time reading source one is equivalent to observing this signal, which is Gaussian, uh, where the mean is not omega, right? But instead omega plus phi one times B. So you're going to bias your reporting in the direction of B and the extent to which you bias it in the direction of B is chosen by you. That's this phi one. Okay, zeta one then governs the noisiness of the signal. So the larger zeta one is sort of the less accurate the reporting is. Source two similarly um, biases their reporting. But source two instead biases uh, their reporting in the direction away from B. So notice the sign swap, this plus here and minus here, phi's are always positive. So the, um, the mean here is omega minus phi two times B. And again, source two is also going to choose a noisiness group. So, right. Now there is a representative newsreader who has access to these two different news sources. And the reader is going to allocate information, allocate attention for a decision at a later time that depends on omega. And these attention allocations are going to be given by our, uh, our previous characterization. All right. So uh, each source's payoff is going to be a sum of two components. So first, each source cares about attention. You can think about this as being reduced form for something like ad revenue. So the first component is the discounted average attention paid to source, uh, source i. Right? These are the attention allocations beta it, r is your discount factor. And then additionally, the source is going to be rewarded for bias. So you can think about these sources as existing in some sort of larger game uh, where the party, so say the liberal party, wants the liberal news source to bias in the direction that's useful to it. Um, but the Liberal News Party doesn't want the source to be uh, you know, infinitely biased because then nobody's going to read that source anymore. So kappa is the bias intensity bliss point from the perspective of the party. And the source is uh, penalized for the distance between phi i and this kappa. Uh, and then additionally, there is this lambda parameter that governs the strength of this incentive for bias compared to the incentive for just getting more attention. All right, and so how does our characterization come in useful here? Well, fixing any choices of bias intensities and noise uh, choices by the two sources, our characterization allows us to pin down the attention path, which allows us to derive the payoffs to the two sources, uh, which then allows us to solve for equilibrium. So we do that and we obtain a characterization of the equilibrium choices of bias intensity and uh, noise. And you know, don't worry too much about the closed form expressions on this slide. I just want to show you that they exist. So this is a symmetric, uh, pure strategy equilibrium. And what we found more interesting was this corollary. Right, so uh, this directly follows from the characterization. Okay, so the equilibrium level of noise zeta star turns out to be increasing in the incentive for bias lambda and increasing in the bias intensity bliss point kappa. So what that tells us is that in an environment in which these sources are more pressured to be polarized by this, the parties that they're, um, you know, in a sense, allied with, it's not just that an equilibrium polarization is going to be higher. So that's mechanically true, right? You amp up the incentives of polarization, that's going to lead to higher polarization in the sense of higher choices of phi, right? Both of these are going to be larger. Oh, sorry, that's a typo. That should be a minus here. Okay. But in addition to that, the sources are also endogenously going to choose higher levels of noise. Right? So 
you know, that wasn't a given. It could have been that the sources provide information that's more biased in the sense of these means being farther from omega, but they compensate for that with more accurate reporting. And what this corollary is telling you is that no, that's not the case. Higher incentives to polarization lead to worse information in both of these senses, more bias and less accurate. All right, so let me just give you a quick intuition in the remaining uh, four minutes or so for why that's the case. So let's suppose um, that, in fact, the two sources choose the same level of bias intensity. So whatever omega is, uh, one source is going one direction towards beta, towards B, and the other source is going the same um, amount in the other direction. Right? Those are the means. Then applying our characterization, we know that there is up to two stages of information acquisition. In the first stage, the source with the more precise information, so that's the smaller noise term zeta i, that source is going to exclusively receive all attention from the reader. In the second stage, the reader is going to split his attention equally, sorry, not equally, he's, he's going to split his attention across the two, two sources, and the fraction is going to be proportional to this noise term zeta i. So the noisier your information is, the more attention you get. And that's roughly because in this, long, um, in this long run, there is an exploitation incentive, right? So the worse your reporting is, the longer the reader has to spend on your site to achieve the same level of information. All right, so then what this tells us is that firms trace a tra uh, phase a trade-off between optimizing for this long run viewership which pushes towards noisier information versus competing to be the, the source that's chosen in the short run, which pushes towards uh, less noisy information. And then uh, what that means is that parameters of the problem that emphasize the long run are going to lead to higher equilibrium noise. Right? So the more important the stage becomes, the noisier uh, zeta is going to be in equilibrium. And so, so one parameter that naturally emphasizes the long run is more patient. So that's actually the second part of the corollary that I skipped. So patient news sources provide lower quality news. Um, and then what's sort of interesting is that uh, higher incentives for polarization, so this larger lambda and larger kappa, also emphasize the long run. So the reason for that is roughly that polarized news sources live in a sort of symbiosis. Right, the more extreme the, uh, the conservative news source gets, the more important it becomes for the reader to read some information on, uh, on the left, right, to, to read some liberal news sources in order to debias the information that they're getting from the very biased conservative news sources and vice versa. So these sources, right, we discussed earlier, complementarity is an important part of what's going on. Uh, these polarized news sources are in a sense providing more complementary information. You can actually think about the, the other extreme. If they don't bias their information, if they're both directly reporting on omega, then they're actually substitutes, right? There's no complementarity going on. Okay, so the more biased they are, the more complementary they are. That emphasizes the importance then or the value of mixing over the two sources, which is what happens in stage two. Uh, so then these higher lambda and kappa actually lead the decision maker to switch from stage one to stage two earlier which then leads the sources to also uh, value more this long run payoff. So they, they actually want to increase their data. All right, so that's just a, a very quick intuition, but hopefully that gives you a sense of how it really is the dynamics of this problem that result in this comparative static. And we're able to study that dynamic uh, aspect quite simply because we have this characterization. Okay, then uh, just to conclude, um, what we've done in this paper is characterize the optimal dynamic allocation of attention uh, across multiple correlated informational sources. And I've shown you that under weak conditions on the prior belief, the solution turns out to have a simple structure. Um, these other potentially interesting properties like history independence and robustness across decision, uh, decision problems. And finally, hopefully I've convinced, that the, uh, convinced you that the characterization is also useful for looking at a variety of applications. Thank you so much again for, for coming and for the invitation.